I'm delighted to introduce to you our today's speaker and welcome Professor Susan Huang <laughs> back to Ann Arbor. She is one of our own. She received her PhD at um, the uh, Department of Asian Languages and Cultures in 2016. Yeah. She is currently an assistant professor of uh, contemporary Korean literature and cultural studies in the Department of East Asian Languages and Cultures at Indiana University. Her um, research interest is in in um, politics and literature uh, from the 1960s to present in South Korea. She is currently working on her book manuscript tentatively titled Uncaged Songs, Culture and Politics of Protest Music in South Korea. And today's talk, A Song of Dissent and Democracy, Marked for the Beloved and the Politics of Resistance in South Korea, I believe is part of her um, working monograph. So please join me in warmly welcoming Professor Susan Huang. Um, can you guys hear me okay? Yeah? Okay. Uh, so, wow. <laughs> Thank you, Professor Wu, for the warm introduction. Um, and good afternoon, everyone. So before I begin ta uh, discussing what I brought with me today, I want to extend my gratitude to the Nam Center for Korean Studies, uh, which is like, you know, my first home for me, <laughs> um, for this wonderful invitation to visit Ann Arbor again and present a little bit of my work in progress. Um, and I want to thank Tohi and Evan especially um, for all the arrangements that you know uh, you made, and also for coming out earlier today. Um, at noon to the Bell Tower on the U of M campus where um, for two full minutes we were able to listen to Carillon um, chimes of the song that I will be discussing today. So um, fortunately we had um, this great opportunity to have the song played through, um, in bell, uh, through bell sounds. Um, and I believe the recording of it is now shared on the Facebook page. So if you want to you know, hear what it's like, um, please do so. Um, so the material that I brought with me today is, as I said, from a, a new project that I've launched recently on the culture of protest in South Korea, in which I'll be looking at the role of songs as prime vehicles for enabling social movements and political protest. Um, especially those songs that were most uh, prominent in two of the darkest decades in South Korean history, uh, namely the 1970s and the 1980s. Uh, for today's presentation, I'll be focusing on one song in particular, a pivotal sonic text in the history of protests in South Korea called March for the Beloved, or uh, in Korean it is Imul Vian Hengjingo. For those of you who may be coming across this song for the first time, March for the Beloved is widely considered to be the most powerful protest song to have emerged in South Korea in the last three decades. Since its birth in 1982, the song has come to be the representative anthem for commemorating those who were killed during a state-authored massacre in 1980. And beyond its direct association with the original historical moment, the song has been sung at some of the most political events in South Korea, uh, not the least of which include... <laughs> okay, hold on. See, okay. Um, the June uprising of 1987, which uh, brought down the last military authoritarian regime in South Korea and ushered in a new era of procedural democracy. It was also sung during the movement to establish a special act on the Gwangju uprising for the prosecution of relative, uh, relevant military aggressors. Okay. And most recently, during the numerous mass rallies of South Korean citizens calling for the impeachment of former President Park Geun-hye over a, a major corruption scandal. So indeed, the status of the song has been elevated to more than simply a routine number in the repertoire of protest. The countless afterlives and the iterations of the songs surfacing time and again at every critical juncture in the history of protest in South Korea, as well as various parts of Asia, 
um, over the last three decades suggest that it has become synonymous with the very concept of democracy itself. So how did this song come to embody such political potency, the effect of which is still going strong even some 30 some years after its birth? In the first part of my presentation today, I will be tra tracing this song back to its origins, um, locating it in its birthplace and time, namely Gwangju in the early 1980s. And in the process of doing so, I'll be analyzing the curious aesthetics that are operating in the making of the song into an anthem for the counter state, a discussion that I hope will further our understanding of how and why the memories of democratization movement are being repurposed through this song by competing political camps in the contemporary moment. And by extension, I hope that it will illustrate why songs above all, were such prime vehicles for enabling uh, political movements in South Korea. Okay. Um, so although the song has gained ample recognition among the South Korean left today as the national anthem and memorial for the Korean populace, tracing its beginnings take us into the heart of the southwestern city of Gwangju in May of 1980. Uh, where a student protest against Chan Doo Hwan's declaration of nationwide martial law was brutally repressed by the paratroopers' indiscriminate killing of protesters as well as bystanders, leading to an armed civilian struggle against state authored military violence. A little less than two years following the bloodshed, in February of 1982, a wedding ceremony would take place not at a chapel as commonly observed, but at a municipal cemetery in Gwangju, where many of the victims of the massacre were buried. Some hundred people were gathered for the event to celebrate the marriage of two souls, namely those of the late activists Park ki Sun and Yun sang won the latter of whom was shot to his death by paratroopers on the last day of the struggle against the military aggressions of the Jeonduan regime. Aside from the fact that this ceremony was happening in a place none other than a cemetery, it was no less than a bona fide wedding, complete with a receptionist table on one side to receive money gifts from guests, okay, and a fresh set of bedding for the bride and the groom on another side to consummate their first night as newlyweds. The physical presence of the wedded couple, however, was replaced by their respective portraits. Soon after the wedding, uh, the soul marriage would become the spark for creation of a musical or genre known in Korea as Noregook. In April of the same year, a writer, composer, and a group of cultural activist students would gather in a remote house in Gwangju to audio record the musical and dedicate it to the couple. Titled Wedding of Light, a ritual to pacify the deceased souls, the musical tells the story of two activists whose fate as lovers is interrupted by their respective deaths until reunited through the soul marriage. Throughout this musical come ritual, the family and friends of Yun and Park repeatedly lament the unfinished love and unfinished dreams of two young souls. In the final scene, the couple, Yun and Park, make an entreaty to the living to carry on the struggle they began by singing the final number in the musical, The March for the Beloved. This is the original recording of the song from 1982 that I'm gonna share with you now. Okay. Um, and while listening to it, I'll um, direct your attention to the lyrics of the song. <laughs>
to dwell upon the lyrics for a little bit here. Uh, as you can see, by the end of the song, the love between these two souls that form the central drama of this musical takes on a new meaning. Because this is a song made to be dedicated as a wedding march, the increasingly strident beat of the song takes one by surprise. The tune, made even more agitated through the almost shrill sound of gengwari, or the traditional gong often used in folk music, which keeps the rhythm intact. The rhythm, the style, and even the instruments that are played in the performance are borrowed substantially from those comprising the traditional shamanic ritual, which is known as gut in Korean. Um, and in a similar fashion, the lyrics of the song also grow decisively emphatic as the song progresses. The opening scene of the song is marked by a visual absence an empty battleground without a single comrade in sight, with only a lone flag fluttering. At the same time, however, the imagery invoked in the song is precisely that of a war zone, a battleground where comrades in arms had once stood shoulder to shoulder in defense of human freedom and democratic justice. Also crucial to understanding the poetics of this song as an anthem of the counterstate is the imagery of the flag as a semiotic vehicle through which sacrifices are transduced to and equated with freedom, the flag charges the deaths with political meaning and relates the dead to the living, consequently invigorating the living through its condensed symbolism. In the beginning verses, the speakers of the song are the living, who are deploring the loss of their beloved leaders in battle. By the end of the song, however, it becomes clear that the speakers of the song have been switched to the dead, and that it is they who are reaffirming their resolution that there can be no surrender to aggression, even in death. In the shift of the voice in the song from the living to the dead, it becomes possible to read this text as a message being sent from the dead to the living. The last verse of the song is particularly effective in this regard, for it establishes a moral imperative for the living to abide by. 
by the end of the song, the dead have become agitating symbols demanding revolutionary political action. As such, the song is less an occasion for mourning the dead, but one in which the dead hails the living to come together to make new alliances and recreate society until, as anticipated in the lyrics, a new day arrives. Although the establishment of a relationship between the living and the dead is central to this song, the slippage from the living to the dead within the lyrics is almost inconspicuous, which in turn prompts one to ask just who is being addressed by the word beloved or nim in the title? Okay. What exactly is the status of nim in the song? Uh, in Korean language, Nim often signifies someone worthy of admiration, adoration, devotion, or sacrifice. Um, in other words, uh, Nim is a concept word that encompasses the widest range of human emotion for which we commonly use the word love in a manner uncannily reminiscent of the much debated usage of the same term by the most famous poet of the colonial era uh, named Han Yong-un in his magnum opus, Silence of the Beloved, or Nime Chinmuk, where the word Nim could mean anything from one's lover to the Buddha, to the colonized Korean nation, the very ambiguity of the word Nim in March for the Beloved enables the song to operate on manifold valences of meaning at once. In the more limited context of the soul marriage for which this song was originally written, Beloved would be the late activist Yunem Park. But in the broader, more politicized context of the Gwangju uprising, and further yet, in the context of South Korea's radicalized terrain of protests in the 1980s, the same word could easily refer to the most privileged category of the decade, or namely minjung, okay, which also um, can be defined as the oppressed masses. So today, I draw out the story behind the birth of this song for two reasons. First, the making of the song showcases the political cultural practice of the time. The lyrics were adapted by Hwang Seokyung, who is a key writer of resistance from the 1970s, from an epic poem penned by a dissident activist, Baek ki while Baek was um, imprisoned for anti-government activities. The poem was then trans transmitted to other writer activists only through underground means an intermittent word of mouth. The poem and the soul marriage between Yun and Park became the inspirational basis for the musical Wedding of Light. The original soundtrack of the mus uh, musical was recorded on a portable cassette player, a method that would have been considered modest even by the standards of the time. The musical itself was never performed publicly in fear of being caught for anti-government activities. After its initial recording, uh, something like 2,000 unofficial copies uh, were distributed out, mainly through Christian student groups in major universities. And within a year's time, the song gained nationwide fame and became the most popular number among student protesters. And it was the song's direct association with underground activism and the state's repression of the political energy unleashed in Gwangju that enabled such explosive popularity of the song among the protesters. Mm -hmm. Secondly, we might also think about the explosive potency of the song in light of the aesthetics that operate both within the song and in the story that circulated with the song. And this had to do with two effects enabled by mm -hmm. the musical. One would be the dramatic creation of a tragic love story between Yun sang -won and Park ki -sun. I use the word creation in the literal sense here because contrary to the musical drama's repeated invocation of a love that could not be consummated in this life or a love between two souls that even death could not destroy, in actuality, Yun and Park had never been romantically involved with one another um, during their lifetime. In actuality, the marriage and death between the two was an idea that was brought, um, brought forth by fellow activists as a symbolic gesture to transform these untimely deaths of two young individuals into a more hopeful scenario of lovers reunited in afterlife. 
Thus, it was a tale of romance that was deliberately forged by activists in an effort to foster a romance of resistance, and better yet, a revolution. The other related effect of intertextuality between the song and the musical would be the consecration of the two activists as representative martyrs of the Gwangju uprising. Today, both Yun and Park are remembered as martyrs, which also in Korean they use the word yeolsa, uh, whose lives were sacrificed in the common cause of democratization in the locality of Gwangju. Upon closer expansion, however, there's a bit of distinction that may be teased out between the deaths of these two people. Although Yun Sang-won, uh, the guy, was killed in the hands of paratroopers during the Gwangju uprising in 1980, this was not the case for Park Gi-sun. Though she was a prominent figure who led the night school reading group for laborers, unlike her husband in death, Yun, she didn't meet her end in the indiscriminate killing of the paratroopers, nor did she take her own life in the form of self-immolation as numerous protest suiciders were wont to do at the height of anti-authoritarian resistance in the preceding decade of the 1970s. The actual cause of her death um, in 1979, in fact, was carbon monoxide poisoning from the charcoal burning in her home furnace while she was asleep. Therefore, it was the story that circulated by the song okay, and the musical and her posthumous marriage to the heroic figure of the civilian army spokesperson, Yun, that enabled the resignification and sacralization of her death, an accidental death, into an icon of martyrdom, which is an unambiguous sign of incorrigible virtue and willful sacrifice. Indeed, going back to the lyrics of the song, we can see how the final message functions as a clarion call to arms issued by pioneers in the front line of a collective battle. Through the line, we are marching on, so those living follow us. Those who died during the struggle, the victims of a massacre, are resurrected as vigilantes marching forward en route to a revolution. So just what was at stake in this deliberate transformation of a discourse of victimhood into a discourse of martyrdom and revolution. Understanding this shift necessitates coming to terms with the meaning of Gwangju and the rise of the counter-state in the 1980s South Korea. Ten days of struggle against state brutality came to an end, leaving behind a palpable sense of defeat for the Gwangju populace, a wound that throbbed more painfully as they endured the paratroopers' merciless singing of military songs in the last days of the uprising, and an even deeper cutting realization that the state was an entity that can no longer be trusted. By the end of the uprising, the city of Gwangju and the lives of its people were indelibly marked by their firsthand experience of the state's naked terror. For the people of Gwangju to remain aggrieved as downtrodden victims of the state's irrational violence was simply inadequate. And to those residing outside of Gwangju, but whose thirst for democracy has been brewing nonetheless since the preceding era of darkness bearing the name of Yushin, the events that transpired in Gwangju were understood less as a resistance than a downright massacre. The military crackdown of civilian protests was regarded as a sheer display of horrific brutality and the state's media censorship of any and all information regarding the Gwangju incident, including an estimate of the deaths incurred, um, only intensified the people's sense of defeat, a sense of disconnect from the movement that occurred in Gwangju, and even a sense of shame for not having partaken in the uprising. It is within such a multivalent context of defeat, shame, and utter loss of faith in the state over the May events in Gwangju that the discourse of protest was actively reshaped from one of victimhood to that of martyrdom. To be sure, March for the Beloved certainly was not the only uh, text that enabled such reshaping of the terrain of protest. As can be discerned, um, even from the title alone of Kim Jun-tae's uh, Jun poem, 
from June of 1980, okay, which was entitled um, Gwangju, the Crucifix of Our Nation. On the whole, the cultural field of the left was heavily invested in re-articulating the deaths as symbols of sacrifice and suffering. And yet, in the immediate aftermath of the uprising, the general sentiment was one of despair rather than resurrection, and often manifested in the destructive form of self-immolation um, by those who demanded the truth. And while literature, especially poetry, did serve to cement a community of mourners, okay, as can be seen in such visual reminders of censors, the written word was all too often made subject to the surveillance techniques of the state. So it was during such a time of explicit censorship that songs, um, precisely because of their nature as performed word, began to proliferate as a powerful means of disseminating political thought and spurring individuals to engage in collective action. Interestingly enough, as the state's political suppression grew more extensive and more severe, Songs that dealt almost exclusively with Gwangju, which is, uh, such as Gwangju Song of Battle or Gwangju Chulsonga, okay, or the Song of May or Ore Nore, and of course March for the Beloved, gained in their popularity through the pervasive practice of collective singing. As it had been with the makers of the song, the very act of singing March for the Beloved became an important means of forging resistance as they actively drew solidarity among Minjung, the Korean populace, across the state's forceful separation between Gwangju and the nation at large. In the dark days of me military crackdowns, uh, media blockades, and the state's attempt at total obliteration of the month of May in Gwangju from public memory, mm -hmm. songs were instrumental in both reinventing the city of Gwangju through the trope of democracy and radically transforming ordinary spectators into active participants of historical change occupying the streets. Over the course of the 1980s, March for the Beloved would be incorporated as a pivotal piece in the South Korean repertoire of protest. It would be chanted endlessly during the June uprising of 1987, fueling the South Korean citizens' cries for direct presidential election as well as during the great labor struggle that would ensue the same year. Um, beyond South Korea, March for the Beloved has also gained resonance in the larger uh, Asian context, uh, the first instance of which may be traced back to Hong Kong in 1984 among labor activists. Uh, and at the time, the melody remained intact, but the lyrics and the title of the song were modified to fit the local context of the labor protests. And over the next three decades, the song would be adopted as a popular number among protesters in Taiwan, China, Cambodia, Thailand, Malaysia, Indonesia, okay, and be sung during such venues as labor struggles, anti-redevelopment protests, and union strikes. Um, so as a case in point, this is a picture um, of the strike, uh, the first strike ever um, by China Airlines flight attendants uh, in Taipei, and this was happening in June of 2016. Okay? It's very recent. So how did this song then come to be um, an emblem of collective surge toward freedom outside of Korea? That it's also being sung in various other countries throughout Asia, often translated into the local languages or the lyrics altered to fit in the context of the local protests, most often labor struggles. Okay. Um, all these uh, facts suggest two things. Okay. One, the extent to which the experience of Gwangju has become synonymous with a kind of authentic spirit of the counter-hegemonic. And two, it showcases how South Korea has become a model not only of successful economic growth and industrialization, but also of a successful transition of to democracy, a substantial part of which had to do with the fact that South Korean labor had undergone the most militant and successful labor activism of the four newly industrialized countries, which includes South Korea, Taiwan, 
uh, Singapore and Hong Kong, um, all uh, in the 1980s. It thus goes, goes without saying that the shared uh, experience of compressed modernization under authoritarian rule is what makes this song all the more relevant for activists in the Asian region at large. And back home in 21st century South Korea, the song would repeatedly find itself at the center of much controversy over how to remember the tumultuous 1980s. Official commemoration of the Gwangju uprising bearing the monumental name of May 18th democratization movement would not be institutionalized until 1997 towards the end of the Kim Yong-sam civilian administration. And in 2003, under the progressive administration of Roh mi March for the Beloved would be designated as the official song to be sung at the commemoration ceremony. Six years later, another president, this time Lee myung bak of the Conservative Party, would make headlines not for singing to the famed tune, but for de-officializing the song from its status as the culminating point of the ceremony. So specifically, a fuzzy but deliberate distinction was made between hapchang, or what the Ministry of Patriots and Veterans Affairs explicated as allowing the song to be sung by those who are inclined to do so, and jechang, or what the ministry defined as requesting that the song be sung in unison by all of the attendees. A rather flimsy rationale provided by the right-wing government in this regard was that because the song was featured in a 1991 North Korean film, incorporating it in a government-sponsored ceremony may prove incompatible with the tenets of liberal democracy in South Korea. Okay. And this would pose, they said, an ideological hindrance to consolidating the national body. And in 2010, again, Lee myung bak would come under criticism by the leftist front and the bereaved families of Gwangju victims for demanding that March for the Beloved be swapped with Miller's song or Bangat Taryong, an upbeat, festive, traditional uh, folk song that begins with the words, I feel good, let's play. The same year, the tug of war with respect to designating the commemoration song would climax, leading both Lee myung bak and the bereaved family members of Gwangju to make a point of boycotting the ceremony altogether. Thus it would be that from 2009, as May 18th uh, rolls around each year, South Korean media would make it a routine of sensationalizing the topic of who among the attendant politicians sang along and who did not. And the conservative resistance as such to the song continues uh, or continued under the former President Park Geun-hye, the degree of which only grew stronger with the conservatives' recent claim that the beloved in the song's title was a direct reference to the founder of North Korea, Kim Il-sung, and New Day in the lyrics, a code word for reunification, branding in the process the lyricist of the song, writer Hwang cha kyung <laughs> as a follower of North Korea, or Jongbuk Chakka. Therefore, we can see how, for the conservatives, the song has come to represent nothing less than the Communist Manifesto itself. So however blurry, the distinction made between hapchang and jechang reflects the anxiety on the part of the right-wing government in singing a song that gained its force precisely as an anthem for the counter-state in the 1980s. But here we might still ask, why didn't the conservatives ban the song from the government-sponsored ceremony altogether? Why would they go to such lengths of making the precarious differentiation between singing if one is so inclined and compulsory singing? Okay. Aside from the obvious reason of violating certain constitutionally guaranteed freedom of expression, this points to the state's felt need to lay claim on the legacies of democratization, so deeply tied to the memory of Gwangju, as it were, because of the currency that those legacies carry as a hallmark of modernity and progress. In addition to the oft-tooted success 
of having achieved industrialization in a very short period. Democratization is another mark of distinction that has much utility to serve for the South Korean state. This can be seen in the contemporary South Korea celebratory self-representation as unique among those formerly colonized nations for accomplishing industrialization and democratization um, simultaneously in record time. If in the 1980s, the state's official response to the memory of Gwangju was either a hasty cover-up or a drastic obliter obliteration, over the course of the 1990s and the 2000s, it has shifted to one of co-optation, but a co-optation that is founded upon the pragmatic impossibility of the conservatives in shunning the memory of Gwangju altogether. So in a parallel fashion, the mass boycott of the May 18th ceremony by the bereaved families and counter-state organizations in Gwangju over the state censorship of the song proves how March for the Beloved has come to confer a kind of an exceptionalist legitimacy upon the people of Gwangju as the true gatekeepers of democracy. Their counter response to the state's attempt to prohibit performance of the song has been to further popularize and globalize, making conscious attempts by producing English language versions of the song, um, as well as vari variations of the original in such diverse musical genres as rock, classical, and even trot. Inherent in this movement is a desire to make this song into a national anthem by promoting international recognition of the song and its attendant memories of Gwangju. In the continued demands from the Gwangju populace and politicians advocating the appointment of the song as the official commemoration text, there's also direct linkages being forged perpetually between the song and, is, and what is often celebrated, um, albeit essentialized, as the spirit of May or Ore Jongshin, okay, or the spirit of Gwangju or Gwangju's Jongshin. So in these bizarre ways, March for the Beloved and the continued advocacy of the song can be said to participate in a production of authenticity in the discourse of uh, dem democratization in South Korea, as can be also said of the earlier creation of the mythical union between Yun Sang-won and Park Gi-sun through marriage and death. At the same time, it is also the embattled controversy and the contestation over the song's rightful place in South Korean society that reinforces its political message. Born in a time of unparalleled political oppression, the song and its multivalent afterlives function as a testament to the fact that sounds and utterances, especially when transmitted through the act of collective singing, have a certain intangible power over such means of repression as curfews, censors, and sirens. And so perhaps what the song's endurance and proliferation over the past 35 years truly demonstrates was best put forth um, some decades ago by the famous singer Harry Belafonte, who when he once said that you can cage the singer, but not the song. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for the wonderful talk. Now we'll open the floor for questions. Thank you for the wonderful talk. Um, I have a curiosity regarding the two activists that were mm -hmm. selected to represent um, the song. Uh -huh. Could you please explain a bit more about the reasoning behind uh, mm -hmm. people selecting Park Ki Sun, mm -hmm. uh, even though she was not directly involved yeah. in the uprising? Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, actually, it's sort of you put your finger right on something that I've been uh, struggling with over the past week. 
Um, so something interesting about Yun Sangwon and Park Ki Sun is that even though they're both from the locality of Gwangju, um, and they both were activists uh, in the sense that both were teachers at night school, some teaching uh, these um, you know, uh, workers, um, you know, or teaching them to read a certain, um, I guess, text about human rights, okay? um, democracy, justice, and um, things of that nature. Okay? But in fact, they were never, as I said, romantically involved with one another. But um, what the distinction that uh, we can make between Yun Sangwon and Park Ki-sun is that Yun Sangwon actually, even though he was born and raised in Gwangju, okay, um, after uh, for college, um, he actually moved up to Seoul, okay, and then sort of you know attended university, you know, and graduated, and then actually had a white collar job in um, at a bank, I believe, in Seoul. Okay. So he moved on to Seoul, but Park Ki-sun. Okay. Um, she's of the working class background. Okay. She never really left Gwangju okay. and always sort of, you know, um, bore the, the, the brunt of, you know, supporting her family through work. Okay. So she was entirely of the working class background. So in, re in reality, what the activists were trying to do in bringing, fusing these two people in a union of marriage was trying to sort of bring, you know, the working class member of Gwangju with someone who's not of the working class background, because there's always the chasm between the elite and the non-elite, right? And that kind of, you know, sort of union between members of different classes was a really important feature in sort of creating, okay, or using their story in order to sort of create this larger um, collective subjectivity that we now remember as minjum. I'm sorry? I was still not seeing the founders. Uh-huh. Well, you know, so, yeah, I mean, you know, the not singing on the part of the right-wing politicians in particular is a deliberate attempt for them, you know, to not acknowledge, um, you know, uh, sort of the, the counter memories of Gwangju that this song embodies, right? The counter memories being um, those that were constantly, perpetually being excised by the state, um, such as the number of people that were actually killed, okay? and the fact that this was a massacre okay? um, and a crackdown on civilian protests. And it wasn't just you know, pro protesters who were killed during the, uh, the crackdown. They were, it was indiscriminate killing of uh, just bystanders and civilians in general. So, you know, it's the singing and not singing part is basically, you know, a way for them to actively either participate or actively ref refuse to participate in taking up of their memory. Yeah. So I see this, this, um, this whole controversy over hapchang, jechang, you know, the way to sort of try to delimit, it, who, delimit who sings and who doesn't. That itself is, you know, there's a whole politics of commemoration there, right? commemoration that has to do with, you know, whose history, are, whose memory are we going to carry on into history, right, the historical narrative. Did you say the state uh, mm -hmm. in the song sort of embodies both the counter-state and mm -hmm. the potentially a state sentiment? I mean, because with Kim Dae-jung and yeah. the official commemoration yeah. of Kwang Ju, mm -hmm. they, they might have taken on mm -hmm. something that's mm -hmm. maybe not counter-hegemonic, but mm -hmm. something that's And even when mm -hmm. the right, I mean, you said that they can't just totally mm -hmm. abolish it, mm -hmm. so they're too kind of legitimizing mm -hmm. democratization, mm -hmm. aren't they? Yeah, and you know, and it, it's not just under the progressive or the uh, progressive regimes of Kim Dae Jung or Do Myon and now uh, Moon Jae in. And you know, with the, on, um, after, right after Moon Jae in came to power, the first thing that he did was re officialize the song. So now the song is the culminating point of the ceremony. Okay? So, you know, 
that kind of already goes on to show you the weight that it carries, such that the state makes all these deliberate attempts to somehow participate in the songs, um, uh, whatever the song embodies. Right? Um, and that's, I think, even true for, to a certain extent for the right-wing government, too. You know, um, I think histor history has progressed in Korea to the extent such that you know, the right-wing government simply cannot you know, do away with Gwangju. Uh, they need the popular support. Um, and in order to do that, they have to somehow, you know, I guess, somehow keep the connection alive, even if it means that it's going to be a, a refusal to participate in the singing part. So hi, Professor um, Huang. Thank you so much for the wonderful talk. So um, I actually have a question about mm -hmm. the different artistic mediums mm -hmm. at the moment of mm -hmm. the cultural uprising mm -hmm. in the 1980s. Mm -hmm. So you have ta so when I was um, reading the lyric of the mm -hmm. song, I was really struck by one line, which says that there was this kind of uh, endless cries mm -hmm. of the awakened people. Mm -hmm. And also, uh, given my very not limited knowledge of mm -hmm. Korean history and mm -hmm. Korean um, cultural um, um, cultural um, objects. So mm -hmm. uh, when I was um, looking at some of the um, works mm -hmm. during the um, Minju uprising, so when I was looking at the woodcut prints produced during the time, I can mm -hmm. um, discover this kind of primacy of mm -hmm. voice. Mm -hmm. So sometimes um, the image will characterize, mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. example, someone is trying to utter mm -hmm. a sound. Mm -hmm. uh, utter a voice, so mm -hmm. I was wondering, so in terms of this kind of political subjectivity and mm -hmm. uh, its relation to this utterance of a voice, mm -hmm. so how could this mass scene mm -hmm. or collective scene mm -hmm. be connected to other cultural mm -hmm. expressions mm -hmm. during the same period? Okay. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> it's a difficult question. But, you know, um, I think like you were, you brought up the woodcuts, right, which were really popular in the 1980s too. And I think it sort of harkens back to a similar experience um, in modern China too, right? Um, and it's a way of encouraging mediums that were easily accessible and readily available to even, you know, people um, who are not economically or socially privileged. Um, so song, as you know, is a popular form of medium. Okay? It, tra it, you know, it gets orally transmitted, okay? and you don't really need to be um, well versed in things like, you know, erud uh, uh, literary erudition um, or political you know, theology or uh, philosophy in order to sing a song and participate in the making of this um, the counter state. Um, and I think in that way, you know, I really see this song as sort of, a, a sort of enabling the transformation of what Gayatri Spivak has called the subaltern, okay? her question of can the subaltern speak? Okay? Well, I think the song does allow, enable the subaltern to speak. And when the subaltern speaks okay, is when the subaltern is no longer a subaltern, but a political subject, right? So, and then in more, I guess, you know, readily um, sort of under, understandable sense, uh, singing, singing does allow sort of democratization of the voice, right? Uh, allows a lot more people to participate made in my mm -hmm. head and I know exactly where to go with this and maybe I'll ask you this where the first association was uh, now mm -hmm. the song, mm -hmm. when you, the song was too gay and you know, the song was trying to give a token to the singing you know, and that was really kind of that was nationalistic sort of thing mm -hmm. and the second association was living in my head was the word mm -hmm. there was 
also a word that is, is used to describe the chorus part of mm -hmm. the revolutionary opera of North Korea. Mm -hmm. So North Korean that you know, Sonangado, revolution opera, mm -hmm. um, it comes from two types of singing, mm -hmm. Tonga and mm -hmm. Tonga mm -hmm. is the operatic you know, solo mm -hmm. and this has the background of singing mm -hmm. in North Korea. So when you said about solving the participatory, mm -hmm. participatory meaning structure, it, it seems to indicate the kind of audience, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. uh, and the ways in which the genre is being used mm -hmm. in the process. Yeah. But the government, South Korean government, just said this is chaisa, mm -hmm. right? To say this is not necessarily participatory activity of those mm -hmm. who would express their mm -hmm. voices and be part of this you know, mm -hmm. community you know, forged by singing, mm -hmm. rather it's mobiliz mm -hmm. mobilizing mm -hmm. you know, a, 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 mm -hmm. uh, like mechanism. Yeah, right? yeah. So I wonder mm -hmm. if the term chaisa mm -hmm. used will anger mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. North Korean you know, performance mm -hmm. genre, or if they have that idea of mm -hmm. turning this participatory mm -hmm. mode mm -hmm. of the performance into mm -hmm. a mobilizing Yeah. Yeah. Oh no, absolutely. And that you know, I never made the connection mm -hmm. till now yeah. with the North Korean uh yeah. Chan Ch uh, Ch yeah, yeah. and that's definitely something. Like yes. Uh, 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 and you know, yeah. I mean, but in terms of ideological mobilization, I think it's really there mm -hmm. in this song and the way that it was mechanized by the counter state movements. Um it was a mo you know essentially mobilizing of the people and it you know the the way the reason i kept talking about it in terms of the counter state is that the counter state is still another form of the state right, right? they're both embark you know mobilizing the people but for different political means or ends yeah. Yeah? um so the fact and the fact that there you know there's also all sorts of um you know, this urgency or this need to essentialize Gwangju mm -hmm. as something that, you know, belongs to the people and only to the people who are associated with that past is also another way of mobilizing memory in order to maintain the counter state as this bodily form. So, uh, you know, and this, the, the interesting thing about the South Korean state you know, calling it, calling that particular mobilization out is that, yeah, they recognize the, I think they're rather fearful of the fact that this can be mobilized into, you know, another sort of a hegemonic form of power or entity. So I think you're absolutely right that, you know, there is this ideological, almost like a nationalistic sense of, you know, mobilizing people that's undergirding this whole, yeah, habchang jechang thing. Yeah. Thank you.